Hello, my name is Professor Sean Parr, and I teach music here at St. Anselm College in the Fine Arts Department. And today, I'll be talking about Hildegard von Bingen and music. Hildegard von Bingen was really amazing. She was a daring innovator and a medieval polymath. She was hugely important for her contributions as a theologian, medical writer, poet, artist, prophet, and most relevant to us today and most important to her, as a composer of music. She was extremely brave, particularly as a woman of her time. She made several preaching tours, which was unheard of for women at the time, but allowed because of Hildegard's conviction that her preaching was inspired by grace. She even criticized corruption in the church, writing to many leaders, including the Pope, about troubling behavior by bishops. A long time coming, Pope Benedict XVI made Hildegard an official saint, canonizing her in May of 2012, and also made her a doctor of the church, only the fourth woman to hold this honor. Pope Benedict called her perennially relevant and an authentic teacher of theology and a profound scholar of natural science and music. He has also noted that Hildegard brought a woman's insight to the mysteries of faith. She contemplated the mystic marriage between God and humanity, the spousal union of Christ and the church, and the relationship between God and creation. Hildegard was tied to the church by her parents at the age of eight, when she entered a Benedictine double monastery with both monks and nuns in Dizzy Bodenberg. She took her vows as a nun around the age of 14. Such was Hildegard's charisma that women soon flocked to join her community, leading Hildegard to found her own convent in Rupertsburg. Hildegard was also a mystic who had visions that she wrote down at God's command. Her book, Scivias, Ways of Knowing, was a famous work endorsed by the Pope and drew many more women followers. In many ways, these visions guided her life and her creation of music, art, and poetry. It might surprise you that Hildegard was actually the first great composer in Western civilization. So, in terms of her contribution to music, we have more securely attributable chants assigned to her name than any other composer from the entire Middle Ages. In fact, she is the only composer in Western music who is also a serious and highly respected theologian. She is also the first composer to arrange for the ordering, copying, and preservation of her musical compositions. Before delving into some of, of these works, I'll give you a, some historical context about music in the Middle Ages, a context that I think also sheds light on Hildegard's connection to our Benedictine heritage at St. Anselm College. In Hildegard's time, the early Middle Ages, music was primarily monophonic, meaning that it was mostly a single line texture, what we call monophony in musical terms. Monophony can consist of a single instrument playing a melody, a solo voice, or a group of voices or instruments all playing the same melody at the same time. So, someone singing the national anthem as a solo before a baseball game would be a perfect example. Singing happy birthday together at a party would be another example. Monophony, in the form of Gregorian chant, is the earliest surviving substantial repertory of music in Western culture. Important to us especially, chant originated in monasteries, an origin cultivated by Benedictine monks in particular. Chant first began as an oral tradition, that is, a performance practice transmitted solely by ear, not by written sources. But why was it monophonic, and why was it vocal and not instrumental? To take the first question, why monophony, we have to understand more about the origins of Gregorian chant. In the first millennium AD, European culture was the culture of Christianity. Most of the musicians we know about were churchmen, and their music was sung in churches, abbeys, convents, and cathedrals. The function of music was to stimulate and enhance worship. Music makes prayer heightened, more fervent, and services with music are then more important and impressive. Music was also considered essential in the Middle Ages, and it was one of the original liberal arts. The texts of the so-called Gregorian Antiphoner, the Roman liturgy, consisted almost entirely of psalm verses, and the recitation of psalms is to this day a common element of Jewish and Christian worship. We don't know exactly when psalmody entered the Christian worship service, but we know it happened by the beginning of the 5th century. Its origins lie in the secluded vigils of the early Christian monks. We've just explored the monastic life in a Benedictine context. Monasticism more generally as a way of life had arisen in the 4th century in part out of a reaction against the church's worldly success, 
following its establishment as the official religion of the late Roman Empire. The reaction was against the increasing pomp and official ecclesiastical presence in search of a simpler, more solitary life. Ascetic communal living was devoted to pious meditative fellowship and productive work. One important aspect of monastic regimen was staying up at night, a discipline known as vigil. In fact, singing and reciting helped keep these early monks awake and assisted in meditation. Reciting the Psalter in an endless cycle became a mantra, so to speak, distracting the mind from physical appetites and filling the back of the mind with spiritually edifying concepts so as to free the higher levels of consciousness for mystical enlightenment. St. Basil wrote eloquently about this. A psalm implies serenity of soul. It is the author of peace, which calms bewildering and seething thoughts, for it softens the wrath of the soul, and what it unbridled, it chastens. A psalm forms friendships, unites those separated, conciliates those at enmity. Who indeed can still consider him an enemy with whom he has uttered the same prayer to God? So that psalmody, bringing about choral singing, a bond, as it were, toward unity, and joining the people into a harmonious union of one choir produces also the greatest of blessings, charity. Christian psalmody emphasized not metaphors of wealth and exuberance, but metaphors of community and discipline, ideas both symbolized at once by unaccompanied singing in unison. Monophony was thus a choice, not a necessity. What better way to feel connected as a community and to display such unanimity than for everyone to sing the same melody and text all together? What better way to show discipline than by cultivating a tradition of collective song? Monophony represents, then, monotheism and a sense of collective oneness. It perfectly reflects all that the early Christian monks idealized with unison singing that was a cappella and thus without the musical instruments of earlier practices. Indeed, this practice of chanting the Psalms has continued to this day. All you have to do to see this for yourself is to go to the Abbey Church and you will see our own Benedictine monks chanting the Psalms during the Liturgy of the Hours at 6 a.m., 12 noon, and 7 p.m. every day. To answer the second question, why singing, we have to think about human singing in the abstract, because singing definitely has a certain power. It does something more than words can do alone. It amplifies texts, it makes them memorable, and it can move the listener in profound ways. Singing sets words apart from ordinary speech, giving them a special status. Through song, it was believed that humans could contact the spiritual realm. Singing is also cross-cultural. All the world's largest religions, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianity, and Judaism, possess and value old and complex systems of chant. Singing is also a specifically human phenomenon. Therefore, we might say that singing is numinous. It connects us to the spiritual or the supernatural, even the divine. It surpasses comprehension or understanding. It's mysterious and it can arouse elevated feelings of duty, honor, and loyalty. It makes sense, then, that the human voice was the original musical instrument, that singing held pride of place in worship. This is a point that is emphasized by countless saints and theologians. Indeed, one of the greatest of the fathers of the church was immensely moved by and enthusiastic about music. You may remember St. Augustine from his conversion story. What you might not know is that he was one of the first to write at length on music's power. For Augustine sometimes cried when he heard music. He wrote that, The music surged in my ears, truth seeped into my heart, and my feelings of devotion overflowed so that the tears streamed down, but they were tears of gladness. Augustine also provides one of the earliest definitions of the hymn, defining it as a song with praise of God. 
If you praise God and do not sing, you do not utter a hymn. If you sing and do not praise God, you do not utter a hymn. A hymn, therefore, has these three things, song, praise, and God. Let's listen to an example of Augustine's favorite type of chant, the melismatic Alleluia. Listen to how drawn out the final ah is in the chant. That's called a melisma. Melismatic singing was pure joy to Augustine, a feeling we still see today in the runs that pop singers from Whitney Houston to Mariah Carey and Ariana Grande and beyond. St. Augustine's words help us understand why singing was the primary mode of musical expression by Hildegard's time. But why was chant called Gregorian? Well, to answer that question, we have to look to the origins of musical literacy, that is, the origins of music writing or notation. The standardization of chants was a huge collective and anonymous enterprise. We call this repertory Gregorian chant after Pope Gregory I. Gregory was mythologized as the source of the musical legacy of the Roman Church, having received inspiration from the Holy Spirit. The beginning of music writing in the West was around 1,000 years ago. And this was a huge moment, historically speaking, for music became visual as well as aural, occupying both space and time. Musical literacy makes music history possible and largely determined its course. To us, writing music down is one of the greatest watersheds in all of musical development. It marks Western traditions as different from other oral traditions. In fact, no other musical tradition in the world has such a rich or long history of written musical sources. The emergence of notation was the byproduct of lucky political and military circumstances. Music sung in the cathedral churches of Rome migrated northward to areas now known as France, Germany, Switzerland, and Austria. Musical notation emerged in that migration. Really, we can thank Charlemagne for, hit for this lucky event. Chant was imported from Rome into northern territories during the Carolingian Renaissance, during the era of Charlemagne and the beginnings of the Holy Roman Empire around 800 AD. Chant was imported because of the emphasis the Carolingians placed on centralizing authority. With central spiritual authority in Rome, with the Pope, Gallic and French rites needed to be suppressed. Charlemagne ordered that psalms and other sung liturgical texts be recorded. First, cantors were brought from Rome to teach northern counterparts the musical traditions by ear and by rote. That was not totally successful, so notation emerged from this very practical need. Broadly speaking, then, there are two motivations behind the use of notation, the need for a memory aid and the need to communicate. As a memory aid, Notation enables the performer to encompass a far greater repertory than he or she could otherwise retain or realize. It may assist the performer's memory in music that is already basically known but not necessarily remembered perfectly. It may provide a framework for improvisation, or it may enable the reading of music at sight. As a means of communication, notation preserves music over a long period. It facilitates performance by those not in contact with the composer. As you can see, early notation just looks like a bunch of dots and squiggles. The set of around 500 antiphons and responses, the repertory we now know as Gregorian chant, was the first notated music. Yet the notation was little noticed, and it was quite rare for composers to claim authorship of these chants. Most were completely anonymous. So, it was quite audacious of Hildegard to claim authorship over her compositions and to devote her life to writing music and theology when by and large almost all creative and scholarly work was done by men. In fact, as a teacher and maker of liturgies, we might think of Hildegard as interested in the idea of a unique female voice. Many of the texts Hildegard set to music feature vivid imagery and contain themes that would have resonated with her convent's community of nuns. 
The vocal range in her music is also much more extensive, that, that is, her songs go higher and lower than most Gregorian chant, another feature that helps us understand her focus on the female voice. Highly decorative, the text and music of Hildegard's songs are intimately related and inseparable. On another level, the songs are meditations upon visionary texts that in turn represent poetically condensed exegesis of complex theological issues expressed at greater length in the prose works she wrote based on her visions. Like all the writings received by the Holy Spirit, ultimately the music's reason for being lies in fostering ruminatio, a chewing over, a method of penetrating the deeper spiritual meaning behind both words and music. As such, the songs are a special facet of the medieval practice of contemplation. Hildegard's music is almost hypnotic, a way of reaching another realm of consciousness, reaching for the divine through numinous song. Let's listen to a brief sample sung by our resident faculty soprano voice teacher, Professor Sharon Baker, who will sing the beginning of one of Hildegard's chants, Columba Aspexit. Hildegard also wrote the first morality play by more than a hundred years. Her Ordo Virtutum is her largest work, and it is also a liturgical drama, a drama because the parts were represented by individuals, liturgical because the presentation was part of the service of worship. Ordo Virtutum is a freely composed drama not connected to any existing chant or ritual, but rather composed to texts and melodies entirely of Hildegard's own creation. Consisting of 82 melodies, the work was performed at appropriate times, including certain matins, lauds, and vespers. It may have been performed at the dedication of the church at Rupertsburg, the German town that was home to Hildegard's convent. In this drama, the devil and the sixteen virtues do battle for the possession of a Christian soul. Hildegard and her nuns would have performed the parts of the virtues and the soul, while her scribe and secretary, a monk named Volmar, would have played the part of the devil. Significantly, the devil has no music. He shouts all his lines. We might speculate that this implies a couple of things. First, that Hildegard didn't want men singing in the drama. And perhaps that hell for Hildegard was a world without music. I'd like you to watch a portion of Ordo Virtutum now. This is a recreation of the work, somewhat historically informed. The video starts just as the virtues have won the battle for the soul. We'll see humility sing, as well as the penitent soul, and then the virtues will bind the devil in chains. I think one of the best things about this video is how entranced the singers are by the texts they utter. I like to imagine that Hildegard and her nuns also felt transported in the performance of this allegorical play. Oh, 
I hope this lecture has given you a different perspective on our Benedictine heritage at St. Anselm College. Saint and Doctor of the Church, Hildegard von Bingen's identity as a Benedictine abbess who contributed greatly as an innovator, visionary, and composer marks her as a unique, important, and fascinating female voice, a voice that does much to help our understanding of conversatio, commitment to a way of life that strives to build community express oneself as an individual voice, and reaches to the divine in striking ways. Thanks for taking the time to learn about her.